Amen. Let's encourage them again this morning. Um, some of you are probably not aware. Uh, they show up two hours early. Sound people, music people. So by the time they're in here, they're in their third hour of singing these songs. Uh, I'm amazed that their voices, God blesses them and their voices hold up uh, once they get to the final final songs. But uh, thank God. Would you please, I know that you uh, have been standing and, and maybe you're unable to, but if you are able, would you stand with me now in reverence to God's Word? Uh, Lord willing, we're going to begin reading in uh, the, the book of 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter number 1. 2 Peter chapter 1, the Bible says this, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises, that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue, and to virtue knowledge, and to knowledge temperance, and to temperance patience, and to patience godliness, and to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness charity. For if these things be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But he that lacketh these things is blind and cannot see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure, for if ye do these things, ye shall never fall. For so an entrance shall be ministered unto you abundantly in, into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, again, thank you for your mercy, for your grace. Thank you for letting me be here. Thank you for the music, those that have put so much time and effort into encouraging us to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for allowing us, for giving us the gift of worship. And thank you. I pray that you were blessed. I pray that you received the, the, the words of worship and praise. And now, Lord, I thank you for your holy word. I ask that you would make me the preacher that you've called me to be. I ask, Heavenly Father, that you would cause me to say exactly what you want me to say the way you would have it said. I ask you to keep me from saying things that I shouldn't say. And I pray, Lord, that uh, you would keep me from distractions of my own heart and mind. Now, Lord, I pray that you would give me a pastor's heart. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. And you may be seated. So when we look here in uh, 2 Peter, we, we've been looking at Brother Peter now for quite some time. And his story, uh, the Lord's been using him in my life in a wonderful way. We've talked about his sifting and how that that is what God used to bring about conversion. And so we're reading these letters. We're reading 1 Peter and 2 Peter, and we've been looking at 2 Peter, and how that these are letters that he has written after the sifting, after the conversion, after what is transpired in his life. And I encourage you to go back and check these things out. I think you can look at them on YouTube. So if you would want to go and do that. But this morning, I want us to look at the additions that Peter talks about, the additions to our faith. So go with me and uh, let's look at uh, verse number three. It says, according as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. So Peter is saying to us 
that the Lord has given us what we need for this life and for the life to come. We are experiencing the power of the Lord so that we, look at what it says of verse 3, according as His divine power hath given unto us all things, we are receiving not human power, but divine power. The Lord God is giving us divine power unto life and godliness through the knowledge of Him that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us, look at this, exceeding great and precious promises. So we've been given divine power and we've been given exceedingly great and precious promises that by these, look at this, ye might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, I understand that there is this hope and this wonderful hope of how we are going to be when this life is over. When this life is over and we enter into heaven, guess what? We're all going to be perfect. Amen. That's a wonderful thought. Amen. I'm as excited about me being perfect as I am you being perfect. So, so, so you say, what do you mean by that? Well, some people, they look at heaven saying, well, hallelujah, when we get to heaven, everybody will be perfect and nobody will be irritating me anymore, okay? That's not, that's not how I'm looking at it. I'm genuinely looking at it as this. I understand I am a huge irritant, okay? And so I am looking forward to no longer irritating you anymore, amen? I'm looking forward by God's grace to that divine nature. But that, this, is, this is talking about actually now. Now, it's talking about in this life, I can be a partaker of a different nature, a divine nature. Legitimately, literally, Jesus has made me a new creature. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Now, I know, well, I think I know, maybe I don't know, and I, I hate to talk about myself all the time, but, but I, I don't want to talk about you. That would be rude. And so... Here's, here's the reality, okay? I understand for the, the, the very, I know, I know me. And I wouldn't describe me as divine. I wouldn't even describe my nature at times as divine. But that, that doesn't mean that it's still not true. You say, well, what, well what's, the pre, what's the problem then, preacher? Let's look at me. You say, well, then, preacher, what's your problem? Uh, addition along with subtraction. Everybody okay? Addition along with subtraction. When we look in this passage of Scripture, it's saying we have been given these promises. We are dealing with a divine power. It's a wonderful thing that we can be partakers of a divine nature in this life. Look at what it says. Exceeding great precious promises that by these ye might be partakers. I'm in verse four of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. That's the subtraction. And beside this, giving all diligence add to your faith. That's the addition. What you and I are experiencing and supposed to be experiences is subtraction and addition. I was horrible in math. Truth be known, if they hadn't, well, well, if I hadn't have been able to run a football in high school, I would have never gotten out of high school. But because I could run a football in high school, this is the truth, they gave me my math grade. They gave it to me, okay? Now, it wasn't because I wasn't trying. I was trying. So he gave me a C for effort. Because if I had not gotten that C, I remember, I remember going to my football coach and I said, coach, we got an issue. And he's like, what? I said, I'm about to fail algebra too. And he's like, okay. And I said, uh, and by the way, if I fail algebra two, I don't play football next year. I got to take it again and I'm ineligible. That's back in the days when that really was a reality. You could actually be ineligible. Okay. I don't know if that exists anymore. He goes, who, he goes, who's your teacher? He went and had lunch. My football coach went and had lunch with my algebra teacher. And all I know is, is my football coach said, come to class, open your book, act like you care, and don't worry about it. And I got a C for effort, okay? Now, this is somebody 
who barely made it out of high school trying to comprehend the depths of this subtraction and addition. I don't know if you have ever considered the reality of this this wonderful passage of Scripture. It's simple subtraction and addition. Thank the Lord, it's not algebra. It's simple addition and subtraction. I did good in addition and subtraction. It's when they took the numbers away and put letters. And I'm like, this isn't math. I don't know what it is. But at any rate, see, by God's grace, we can. By His divine power, we can. Even if we struggled horribly in math, we can do simple addition and subtraction. Are you okay? When we look at this, here's what I want us to look at. Number one, I want us to look at the blessings that come with these additions. Look at verse 8. Verse 8, for if these things, these additions, for if these things be in you, now let me make a little note here, make a note, all right, in your Bible. It doesn't say if these things be on you. This isn't something that you put on and take off. This is something that is transpiring and taking place inside of you. It's an in thing. It's an in, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a changing of in you, okay? This isn't something that we put on. It's something that is worked in us. He goes on to say, if these things be in you and abound, okay, that's leaning into multiplication. That scares me, all right? (laughs) They may make you that ye shall, look at this, neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. What is one of the blessings? One of the blessings is is you will be fruitful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. The opposite of unfruitfulness is fruitfulness. So we will be fruitful. What does this knowledge mean? It means recognition. It means discernment. It means full discernment. Peter is implying that knowing Jesus more is the objective and that, no, and that knowing Him more is the measurement of fruitful existence. Do you as a Christian want to know Jesus more? Do you want to know Him more intimately? Do you want to love Him more? Do you want to understand His love more? This is, this is moving beyond a relationship that I just want more from Him. I want to know Him more. This is what's supposed to take place in time in a marriage. This is what's supposed to take place in friendships. And this is what can take place in our relationship with Jesus Christ. You may have gotten saved just because you wanted Him to save you from hell. That may have been your motivation. But as we move on, there should be this addition. Are you listening? There should be this addition. I'm not just, hallelujah, I'm not going to go to hell when I die. But now, it's not just that I'm not going to go to hell. There's an intimacy that I'm wanting to know Him more. This is the measurement. This is what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be wanting to know Him more and more and more. Peter is also alluding to the fact that by adding these things, we will see more clearly the leading of Jesus in our lives we will be able to understand what is, the, what, what is of the Lord and what is not of the Lord. It's called discernment. And I know that some people have what we may say is the gift of discernment, but not everybody has the gift of discernment, but everybody has the ability to add discernment. Every one of us have this ability to add this understanding of Jesus, to understand, okay, this all that Jesus is leading me in this direction. And I, I, I do. I, I look at our world and I look at the church and, and I look at myself and I think, to, think there is so much confusion in the church of Jesus Christ. There's so much confusion in Christians' lives. And here's what I think is happening. I think it is, it's, I think that there hasn't been any addition. But if we add these things, we can be fruitful. 
we can understand. We will even be able to properly measure success and fruitfulness. There are so many Christians that are struggling with whether or not they're having a successful life and how to even measure that. Well, somebody say amen. I'm getting a lot of head nods. If you say amen, it helps me move on. Okay. Yeah. Even struggling. Am I? What? Uh, uh, yeah. But if we will add these things, these things, let me ask you this, and I mean it sincerely. Is your, is your soul barren? Now, I'm a born-again believer, but if I'm going to look at my soul, my, my soul's still a bit barren. Is, is, your, is your life uh, look a little bit fruitless? But you're a Christian. I'm not denying your relationship with Jesus Christ. I think that's where we find ourselves sometimes because we look for the fr fruitfulness and we look for the sense of fulfillment, the, the lack of barrenness the sense of fulfillment. And we look in our lives and we don't see the sense of fulfillment and we don't necessarily know the measurement of the fruitfulness. And so we look at this and so what it's done is it's causing us to have confusion, which guess what that is? That's the opposite of discernment. But if we add these things, the blessing is, is discernment. The blessingness is fruitfulness. The blessing is that we will not be barren, but our souls... Our souls, ladies and gentlemen, can be thriving, not just surviving. John chapter 15, verse 7, If ye abide in me and my words, these are the words from Christ, If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, Jesus says, that ye bear much fruit, John 15, 8, so shall ye be my disciples. And I've been, I've been told all kinds of things of what that fruit is. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things have I spoken unto you, that, ye, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. This is what Jesus wants for us. And he's saying, basically, it'll happen if you will abide in me. And we ask ourselves, well, how do I abide in you? Well, Peter, after going through what he went through, are we getting this? After the sifting that he has gone through, if you look at Peter's life, he thought it was some things, right? And then he found out, well, no, it's not those things, Peter. But this is the thing. And now he is telling us after his conversion, you got to add these things. And we'll get to these things. But right now, I just want you to understand the blessing of the addition. Okay? There is this reality that we can have joy, that it would be remaining joy, and that it would be full joy, but it's not in what we think it is. It's in Christ, as we sang this morning, and Christ alone. If we look at this, you will be fruitful in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Are you fruitful in your knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ? He says, and you will not fall. Look at verse number 10. Verse number 10. I think we need the air conditioning maybe turned back on. Verse number 10. Wherefore, the rather brethren give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if ye do these things, add these additions, ye shall never fall. What? What? Never fall? Now this isn't talking about physical fall. It's talking about spiritual falls. And just as we are cautious if we're hiking up a mountain, if we're walking down a path, or even if we're walking through a parking lot, no one wants to fall. It hurts physically when you fall. It hurts to fall. Well, guess what? It also hurts when you spiritually fall. It hurts. Hurts your soul. Hurts your spirit. If we put it in this way, it hurts your heart and it hurts your mind. Your heart is hurting and your mind is hurting what? When we fall. So here's what the scripture is telling us is if we will make these additions, we will not fall. What does that mean? It means to trip. That is to err, sin, fail. It means to offend. We can legitimately not offend the Lord. We can legitimately not live lives 
of failing, falling, however you want to put it. I'm truly grateful, and I am. Listen, I am. God knows. God knows. I am truly grateful for 1 John 1, 8. Let me read it to you if you don't have it memorized. I have it memorized, okay? <laughs> if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, verse, verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. I thank God that that's in the Bible. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. I am grateful of this reality that if I do sin, I can confess my sin and he forgives me and cleanses me of my sin. And that's wonderful. But guess what? There's also 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. Look what it says. Bring it up on the screens if we can. My little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. We're not supposed to be trying to sin. We're supposed to be trying not to sin. And we, we get that, right, Christians? We get that. We're not happy about our sin. It's true. It hurts when we fall. Can I get an amen there? And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, if you and I could understand and comprehend this, your heavenly Father doesn't want you to sin. He doesn't want you to fall. You want to know why? Because it hurts you. It hurts him, but not the way it hurts you. Are you getting it? Just like when my children would fall. It would hurt me. I didn't want them to fall. That's why I held them like this for as long as I could. I held them like this, and then they just got, you know, a little stubborn and wanted to do it on their own, right? And so there was, a, there was some, some of this sometime. You know, they would, they would get a hand free. Y'all didn't have children like that. And they would kind of, they, they were wanting to do this on their own. And so you do this and you find yourself doing this even when they're 20 years old. And, and, you're, and you're trying and, and they're doing this. What am I worried about? I don't want them to fall. I don't want them to fall because it's going to crush me. No. No. It's going to hurt them. That's why I don't want them to fall. Is this making sense? And it's the same way with our Heavenly Father. And so when we look at this, and i got to hurry. I, I'm going I'm to try to hurry here. So when we look at this... We, we need to see that these things are written to us that we sin not. And thank the Lord, if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. And He is the propitiation for our sins. He pleases the Father. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And hereby we do know that we know Him if we keep His commandments. Not if we break them. So you see, what happens when we break His commandments... It interferes with what we know, not what he knows. Because if you'll go on and read the rest of the passages, you'll find out that even when our heart condemns us, he is greater than our heart. And so what he is trying to get us to do is to live in a life where we can pray the prayer of faith. Why? Because when we pray the prayer of faith, faith availeth much. Are you listening? But what happens is, is when we fall... We lose faith in what? The whole thing. If we fall far enough, and if we fall hard enough, you can almost lose faith in the whole thing. Forgive me, Lord, for saying thing, but you, you understand what I'm meaning. But where, what's, what's the problem? The problem is, is our failure. We have failed ourselves. And he understands what our failure does to us. He never, please don't get upset with what I'm about to tell you. He never had any faith in you. And while you were a sinner, Christ died for you. When you were, when you were the worst you've ever been, Christ died for you. You understand? You and I were on our way to hell. We were stinky sinners, right? And... Even while we were yet sinners, according to Romans 5, 8, God commendeth his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. No, this isn't about him putting faith in you. He's never had any faith in you. He understands that if you fail, it disrupts 
your faith, period. Everybody okay? And so what he's saying here is this. He is saying if we keep our commandments, does it make us righteous? No, we are righteous by faith in the perfect person and the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. This is not the doctrine of justification. It's the doctrine of sanctification. We are not justified by perfection. We are made perfect because we have already been justified. And we are are not operating to attain holiness. We are coming from a place of holiness and walking it out. God made you holy in Christ. Or you wouldn't get to go to heaven at all. Everybody okay? Okay. So when we're looking at this, this is what we're trying to comprehend. So then preacher, what's this whole addition thing about? This whole addition thing about is so that you can have a soul that is fruitful. A soul that's healthy. A soul that's thriving. A soul that has joy and is full of joy. As we move on, when we look at this... I want you to look, number two, the result of not adding these things. i got to hurry. The result of not adding these things to our faith. What will happen if we do not add things? If we do not add these things, verse number nine, but he that lacketh these things, I'm in first, uh, excuse me, second Peter chapter one again, but he that lacketh these things is what? He is blind, he cannot see afar off, and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. If we do not do the addition... If we do not do the addition, here's what happens, blindness. What does this mean? It means opaqueness. It means smoky. Our eyes will be smoky. It also implies physically and or mentally smokiness. Your worldview will be smoky. Your comprehension will be smoky. What is God's will for my life? I don't know. I can't see. It's kind of smoky. Why, 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 can't I, why, why can't I seem to get anything right? I, I don't understand it. Well, it's because it's smoky. You want to know why? Because there's not been addition. But I asked Jesus Christ to save me, and he has taken away all my sins. A man subtraction. Are you listening? And I am thriving against the lust of my flesh. I even got rid of cable. <laughs> subtraction. Are you with me? But there also has to be addition with the subtraction. If we add these things, look at what it says. If we do not, there's blindness. And then we look at it, look at what it says. It says that these things is blind and cannot see afar off. You know what it is? Short-sightedness. No, 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 under, no, no comprehension towards things bigger. It's, it's kind of like this. It's not seeing the big picture. And when we don't see the big picture, we're narrowing everything down into our lives and it gets so microscopic. And when we get so microscopic in in, in ourselves, because most examination takes place of self-examination in our world. We have been so, listen, this is a side note and, you know, it's free, but I hope that you'll receive it. Here's the reality, okay? You and I have been so indented, in, inundated with other religions in the United States of America. Do you know right now that most Christian psychologists, I heard this the other day or read it, I heard it, that most Christian psychologists today, when they're trying to help Christian parents parent better, they are coming in contact and they realize they have to debunk the influence of at least five to seven Middle Eastern point of views of religion in parenting today among Christian parents. You have to start debunking the influence of Middle Eastern religion. Middle Eastern religion is introspection. Look in. Look in. Microscope yourself. Look in. And I'm not talking about looking in to the Holy Ghost. I'm talking about looking in to you. And here's what you're going to find out. Depression, depravity, discouragement. You don't have the answers. You know what that's called? Well, let's look and see what it's called. It's called not seeing things afar off. 
It's not having a Christian worldview. It's not having a it's not having a life. It's not having a Christian life view. You're not examining your life from the Christian, biblical, scriptural lens because you have been inundated and affected by Karate Kid. You say, you got a problem with Karate Kid? No, I just got a problem with some of the stuff that they put in the movie. You say, what, which Karate Kid? The one that I watched <laughs> when I was a kid and wanted to be Karate Kid. Is this making sense? There's these, there's these influences, folks, and here's what's happened. If we do not make these additions, you know what will happen? Someone else will. Do you realize this, don't you? There is a plan for your life by the, by the God of glory and by the hater of God. The hater of God has a plan for our lives as well. We are short-sighted. Seems that it would indicate the lack of of seeing the big picture. It's a lack of forethought. Uh, Matthew 6, and you know I reference this verse a lot, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. I don't think Peter is teaching that you add these things to your faith uh, so you will be able to see what future uh, stacks or future, future your stocks are going to do well. Uh, that's not what he's talking about here. I think he's saying you will not look far enough into the future. If you don't add these things, you will not look far enough into the future. You will not have treasures in heaven and that messes up everything. A Christian is supposed to see heaven. A Christian is supposed to be looking forward to heaven. That's what it's supposed to be. And sometimes we don't. Proverbs 22, 3 says, A prudent man foreseeth the evil and hideth himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. It's basically saying that a man that has some foresight, a man that has some uh, discernment, has some understanding, it, it, he then can see evil and say, Oh, that's not good, and goes over here. Someone who doesn't have it looks at it and keeps walking towards it, keeps walking, and then finds himself in it. Christians can find themselves in all kinds of messes. Oh, my. Forgetfulness. Look at what it says. Here's what will happen if we do not add. If we do not add. But he that lacketh these things is blind. We looked at that. Everything's opaque, smoky. Cannot see things afar off. Does not have a Christian or a scriptural view of life in the world. And hath forgotten. Look at this. This is sad. And hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. Forgotten. You know what that word purged means? It means a washing off. It means an expiation. Morally cleansing. He will forget it. But wait a minute. I trusted Jesus as my Savior. Yes, you did. And if you do not make these additions you will forget what Jesus saved you from and cleansed you from. And before you know it, if you're not careful, you'll turn around and go back into it. You want to know why? Because there is a part of you that has yet to be cleansed. And that's your flesh. And your mind and your soul, your spirit, your, your, your heart, your mind, if you're not careful, will start listening again to the lusts of your flesh. And you'll forget, oh, I got saved from that. And it'll almost be, listen, I'm trying to love you. Are you letting me? It'll almost be like salvation didn't work for you. It just didn't work. That's not the way it's supposed to be. Not at all. When we look, we will forget. 1 Corinthians 6, 9 says, Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Do you not know that? Are we there? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God? Be not deceived, neither fornicators, that's talking about sexual immorality, 
nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, that's talking about homosexuality, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revival. See, we would like to take some of this list and say, okay, these people do not see the kingdom of heaven, and I understand why they don't. But as the list keeps going, you find yourself in the list. Nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners shall inherit the kingdom of God. And look at what it says. And such were some of you. Such were some of you. But ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of God. How are you washed? How are you sanctified? Jesus did that. Here's the issue, and I'm saying it because I love you. My, my fellow Christian, here's the issue. You forgot it. Why? Because not making additions. You tried making the subtractions. Are you with me? You tried making the subtractions. And it worked for a while, but because we haven't made the additions. I hope this is helping. The, i got to move on. The responsibility of ours is ours. Look at what it says. We're going back now. We're going back to verse number five. And beside this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue to virtue knowledge. The, little, the, the first few pieces of verse five, and beside this, okay. Now what this is meaning is, the Lord has given us precious promises. The Lord is operating in our lives in divine power. This is what Jesus has done and is currently doing. Now, what's supposed, beside all this, what's supposed to come alongside all of this? All that Jesus is doing, all that Jesus has done. Are you with me? You got you with me? All that Jesus has done, what's supposed to come along beside it? You agreeing with him, that's the other component of sanctification. There's the sanctifying of the spirit. There's the sanctifying of the blood of Jesus Christ. There's the working of God in your life. You would not be here this morning if God had not begun a work in your life. And he's going to perform it. He's going to finish it. Hallelujah. But here's the part where we get discernment. This is where we get all of the blessings that we've talked about this morning. Here's what happens is, is we come along. Our wheel comes along beside the wheel of the Holy Ghost and we start making additions. We start adding. When we look at this, giving, it says, come alongside, it says, giving all diligence. It means to bear alongside. It means to introduce sim simultaneously. It's as, this, it's as if this, and this is the mistake that some Christians make. They accept Jesus as their Savior, and their life is about don't, 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 don't. And so they, they, they struggle and they fight to stop doing what they were doing. Can somebody say amen? amen? But the other part of it is this. It's the doing. And we're supposed to give as much diligence to the additions. We're supposed to be subtracting and we're supposed to be adding. Does this make sense? It seems that we are receiving the promises of God. We are supposed to be becoming alongside or come alongside with God. Hebrews 12, 1 says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which doth so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. We are supposed to be engaging with the addition. I'm almost done. Giving all diligence. That word all diligence means speed. That means eagerness, earnestness. It means diligence with forwardness. We're supposed to be doing what the Apostle Paul said he lived his life. Dying daily, forgetting that which is in the past, and pressing 
forgetting and pressing. Is this making sense? It's all, it all hooks up. Why? Because it's the Holy Ghost that's teaching us. Right? And so here's what's supposed to be going on. We are supposed to be moving forward. All diligence. Add. That means to furnish beside. That is fully supply. That is to contribute. So here's what it is. You and I genuinely have a choice to make. Now let me tell you the rest of the story to my uh, horrible math problem. Right? I barely made it out. I go off and I get a job. Guess what I have to know to do my job? Algebra. You know what I had to do? And I, I mean this in the best way how. I had to go back to college, and so I did. Yeah. I got a job that required. Right? So I went back to college. Thankfully, hallelujah, I'd actually done it before I took the job. You know why I went back to college? Because... I didn't want to be embarrassed when my friends saw me and wondered, what are you doing back in town? Because I had left town. I was going off to be a big guy, you know, big man. And I, it didn't work out. And so when I'm delivering pizzas to my friends that are in college, there's nothing wrong with delivering pizzas. So I'm delivering pizzas to my friends that are in college. They would say, what are you doing? I thought you was over here doing it. And I said, yeah, yeah, I decided not to do that. I decided to go back to school. So I'm just, work, you know, making some money going back to college. It was purely pride. But what would you take? Algebra. Why? Because it's what I didn't learn. I went and I learned algebra. Then I got a job that required algebra. Now, where in the world would we be if all of us, by God's grace, would just decide, okay, yes, I'm trying my best to say no, but now let me say yes to making these additions to the life God wants me to have. And starting with this, add to thy faith, what? Virtue. Virtue. When we look at this, we have a choice to make. If you'll go back to Joshua chapter 24, and we'll not do it for sake of time. I I went longer than I intended. In Joshua chapter 24, you'll find that Joshua is about to lead the children of Israel into the promised land. Here's the unfortunate, uh, the sad part about it is he's leading a different generation because the generation that had received the promise didn't get to go into the promised land because at their moment of getting to go into the promised land, they didn't. They, they balked. They stopped. They didn't go in. And that entire generation of people died over the next 40 years wandering through the wilderness. They all died. Now Joshua is getting ready to go into, they're getting ready to cross over, and he has a speech to Give to the people, and I'm paraphrasing it, in John chapter, excuse me, Joshua chapter number 24. And he looks at this next generation and he says, you've got a decision to make. You have got to choose. And I'm going to put it like this. You've got to choose. Are you going to think like your parents? Or are you going to think differently? The difference, and we got good parents in here, okay? But what's the difference between those that make these additions and those that never do? Summed up in this, choose this day is what Joshua looked at him. He said, choose this day, today, whom you will serve. And as you know, the famous verse, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. So choose today. You have, you've got divine power. You've got divine promises. Choose today to make these additions. Some would say, well, I want to add virtue. What is virtue? If you really want to add it, you'll go home and find that for yourself. Don't let me do all your studying. Amen. 
Would you stand? Father, we thank you for letting us be in your house today. Thank you for the words that you have given us from your word. Thank you for the word that you have spoke to my heart about. And I'm thankful that you're, you're, you're putting this into my heart. Thank you. Now, Lord, I pray that you will do the same among this congregation of people. I pray, Heavenly Father, that they will, by God's grace, by your grace, they will even go home and begin to investigate in your scripture what is this virtue that is to be added to our faith. I pray that they will do that, Lord. Thank you for the divine power. Thank you for the precious promises. Thank you for what you're going to do in our lives. I thank you in the name of Jesus and for his sake we pray. Amen. We're going to allow